This lecture will cover Chapter 4, Robot Systems, from the FANUC Handling Tool Operators and Programmers textbook. In this lecture, we're going to cover the robot components, the major and minor axes. We're going to talk about servo motors and serial pulse encoders, what software is used with the robot in their operating system. We're going to talk about the different controller types and become familiar with the different standard operator panels. The robot system is comprised of four components, the, the mechanical unit or the robot, the software that's used to control the robot, the controller, and any peripheral equipment, which includes end of arm tooling or any equipment that is used with the robot. It's important to note the robot F number which can be found on the bottom left corner of the controller panel. This F number is a unique robot identification number and is always used when calling uh, FANUC and referring for uh, support or assistance. In our classroom, we're going to be using the LRMate fenceless cert cart, which looks like this. On the cert cart, we have an LRMate 200ID slash 4S robot unit. We also have a 2D vision, IR vision camera with a light, a pneumatic gripper, that's our end of arm tooling, with a laser pointer, an air compressor, which is used to provide air to the gripper. The R30IV controller, which is down here below the cart tabletop. And the R30IV teach pendant, which is the computer pad here that's on a long cable attached to the controller. And this is what the operator is using when the operator is programming the robot. It's worthwhile to note that the uh, LRMate cert cart has a DCS speed position check software, which is used to uh, provide safety measures for the LRMate during operation. All right, so let's talk about the robot unit. All right, and what are the robot axes and joints? that we use when we're programming the robot. All right, joint number one is called the waist, and it operates at the bottom of the robot. It allows the robot to rotate around that axis. Joint number two is the shoulder, and it's located just above the waist. Joint number three is the elbow, located just above the shoulder. These three joints are what we call the major axes, joint one, joint two, and joint three. Joint number four is the rotation of the arm. After the elbow, the arm is connected to the elbow, and joint number three allows the arm to move up and down. Joint number four allows the arm to rotate. Joint number five is the pitch of the wrist. So the wrist unit is at the end of the arm and it can pitch or rotate up and down. And that is joint five. Joint six is the hand or face plate. And that's this black unit on the end of the robot arm attached to the wrist. And this can rotate as well. When you're thinking of all these different joints, it's easiest to think of your own waist, shoulder, elbow, arm, wrist, and hand, because the robot operates very similar to how your own wrist, shoulder, elbow, arm move. Joints four, five, and six are called the minor axes. So this is a six axis robot. We could have a seventh axis and a seventh axis would be an axis 
that allows the entire robot to move on a rail. All right, and on your teach pendant, you can see there is a slot for a joint seven. We don't obviously have a rail that we can run the robot on, but if we did, we could program joint seven and allow it to move the robot laterally on that rail. So, so this could be a seven axis robot, but in its current configuration, it is a six axis robot. End of arm tooling is very specialized. Uh, this is, as I said in the other video, this is really, uh, the, the business end of the robot. It's, it's what you're going to be moving the robot to take advantage of or to use in, in every situation. Um, it's the equipment on the robot that interacts with other parts and components outside of the robot. It is typically attached to the end of the robot arm, that is the faceplate. So if we go back here, the end of arm tooling or end effector is going to be attached to the hand or faceplate um, that is uh, right now joint six. There's really an unlimited variety. There's all kinds of, of grippers and they're coming up with all kinds of, of new grippers because as each need arises, a gripper or end of arm tooling is being developed in order to deal with that uh, part or component or action that needs to be done. So we have grippers. These can also be magnetic or vacuum, but um, in our case, we have a pneumatic gripper. That is a gripper that's operated by air. There's welders and sprayers. There's sensors for force, collision, etc. Uh, there's material removal tools such as drills, end mills, face mills, and then we can also have tool changers. In the first video, we talked about the mechanical unit that provides power or drive to the robot. Each axis is going to be driven by an electric servo motor. All right, these electric servo motor motors use a serial pulse encoder for positioning. And we talked about that feedback system that allows the robot to know exactly where it is at all times. This is how we're able to program and make the robot move in a controlled manner. Okay. Um, most motors have an internal brake. Ours has an internal brake. It's applied mechanically. It's released electrically by the signal from the servo amplifier. Uh, the motors can be damaged by improper lubrication of the robot. Brake failure is typically due to a lack of current at the brake rather than failure of the brake itself. And if the brake fails, the motor may, must be replaced. The serial pulse encoder is really what allows the servo motor to control the robot and to allow the position and speed of the robot to be known at all times. And as I said, this is integral. This is um, very, very critical to the operation of the robot. If the robot loses its, um, its, its ability to tell where it is, whether through the position or speed, then it really is an ineffective robot. It's no longer a closed loop system and it becomes an open loop system and we can't really use it. Each motor has a ro rotary pulse enclosure. The encoder is a device that senses the angle of the motor shaft. Um, it, it really senses the rotation of the motor shaft. So as the, ro as the motor shaft rotates through different angles, right, the motor shaft can rotate 360 degrees. Um, as it, the, the encoder keeps track of the angle as the, as the motor shaft rotates. And that information is sent to the controller so that the, so that the robot each uh, encoder knows exactly where um, each joint position is at all times, including the speed of, of that, how, how quickly the joint is moving to a position. Um, as I said, this is, this is very critical. Um, the encoder pulse counts are stored in the robot memory when, when the robot is powered. Um, when the robot is powered down or turned off, the batteries retain the pulse encoder counts. Um, so when, you, when we turn it on, the, mo the robot remembers where it is. All right, the R30IB uh, Plus controller, um, which is located at the bottom of the cert card, it's the large rectangular box. 
that's basically where the com- the brains of the robot are are being stored. That's you know you can think of that just like a uh, a desktop computer. That is where the um, the information for the computer, the software, um, the main board, the power supply, the amplifiers for the servo, um, the e-stop, the battery, all that critical information or critical hardware is stored in the R30 uh, IB plus controller. On the front of the controller, we have the standard operator panel. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the R30 IB plus standard operator panel. And there's four areas on the on the standard operator panel. On the left hand side, we have the mode select switch. All right. And in this switch, we can turn from the T1 mode, which is the position that the key is at right now. This is a key, by the way. Um, so right now it's positioned at the T1. That's the that's the teaching mode. T for teaching, that's the teaching mode. Um, and then we can also turn it to the auto mode, right? Auto is when we want to run a program um, and that's, uh, you know, that's when we basically turn off the um, the teach pendant and the, the robot runs in auto mode, right? In order to start the robot in auto mode, we're going to hit the cycle start button. So that's the green button right here. All right, we don't have to hit the green button when we're just going to be working in T1 or teaching mode. All right, um, the E stop is the large red button in the yellow uh, circle there. That's used whenever we have an emergency and we need to stop the robot immediately. So hitting that button will immediately stop the robot. It will apply a break to every one of the joints and it will stop the robot, whatever it's doing at whatever speed, okay? Um, and then finally, on the right-hand side, we have the master on-off switch. This is the switch that we're going to use to uh, turn the robot on and off. All right. Um, so remember, uh, we don't really use the green button unless we're in auto mode and we want to run run a program that we've that we've uh, programmed for the robot. Normally, when we're teaching the robot, that is when we're teaching at points, when we're writing programs, we're going to be in T1 mode. All right. There are other operator panels depending on the uh, controller unit. So different robots have different controller units. As I as I said, we're our robot is the R30 IB plus. So up on the top, the, this is the this is the panel for the R30 IB. Then we have the R30 IA panel here, RJ3 IB panel looks like this. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we have the R30IA slash RJ3IC. I know this is all confusing, and we really don't need to know uh, all these different uh, operator panels because we're not going to be using these in the, in the class. But it is worthwhile to note that each operator panel is slightly different, and there's different um, you know bells and whistles and lights and buttons on each panel. You'll note, though, that each panel does have uh, some commonalities, namely the e-stop button. All the panels will have an e-stop button. Uh, all the panels will have a cycle start button, a green button. Okay. Uh, and all the panels will have a mode selector switch. All right. So this is our standard uh, operating pa- operator panel with uh, some of the missing things that we don't have on the R30 IB, such as the fault reset. This is basically the reset button. Um, in our robot, when we have a fault and need to reset it, um, we can do that through the uh, by switching to T1 mode and then do it through the um, the teach pendant. Okay. Um, you'll note that there are there are some additional lights on this panel. We have a fault light and we have a power light. We don't have these lights um, on our panel. Um, the the fault light is going to be or any fault indication is going to be shown on the teach pendant. You'll also note that we have a, an additional mode on the mode select switch. So. Our robot, the R30 IB and the LR Mate robot, has T1 and auto. This one also has a T2 mode. All right, we'll talk a little bit about T2 mode um, later. 
All right, the robot software that's that's housed in the robot controller um, defines the function of the robot, right? It also contains core operating program information such as fault isolation, diagnostics, and communication protocols, right? The software allows us to program the robot, all right? So that's really the function of the software in addition to the other uh, uh, features that we talked about here. Peripherals are the connected equipment to the robot, all right? This includes the end of arm tooling, right? If you, if you go back to the picture of our LR mate on the cert cart, you'll remember that we have a camera, that's a peripheral. Uh, we also have the gripper, the end of arm tooling, that's a peripheral equipment. Um, we have a light, that's peripheral. Um, what else do we have? We have a laser, that's peripheral, okay? In addition, we also have a conveyor belt uh, attached to the tabletop. That conveyor belt, when it's attached to the robot unit through the controller, would be peripheral equipment as well. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, the mode select switch. Um, typically, it's going to have an auto T1 or T2 mode, all right? Um, some controllers will not be equipped with T2 modes like our controller. Um, T2 mode, and we're going to look at it right here. Um, T2 mode is another teach mode, right? T for teaching. Um, so in addition to the T1 mode, we have the T2 mode. Now here's the difference. You'll notice with the T1 mode, and this goes for our robot as well, um, T1 mode has a speed restriction on it. Okay, so we cannot go at full speed when we're in teaching mode T1, all right? And in fact, we have to move at less than 250 millimeters per second, all right? Sometimes, so, so when we're uh, making a program, testing the robot with that program, we can never go at full speed, the speed that we might have programmed uh, for the robot to operate during auto mode, all right? In some cases, that's overly restricted, okay? So think about it this way. If we're teaching our robot to weld, right? If we're gonna have the robot weld a straight line, um, if we can only test the welding program at a restricted speed, we're never going to be able to tell if the weld is going to be traveling at the proper speed during full operation, okay? So this is where T2 mode comes in. T2 mode is a teaching mode that is not restricted in speed. So we can go at full speed during T2 mode, but not in auto. Okay, so it's not an auto mode. Now, this is actually a very dangerous uh, teaching mode. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you definitely have to be careful with that because the robot is capable of moving at full speed. It's going to move at full speed um, and it's not going to be restricted in any way. Um, and again, I'll note that our robot does not have a T2 mode. Um, and in fact, I was told that they're moving away from T2 two modes in a lot of the future robots at FANUC. And uh, the auto mode, uh, this is where the robot is going to be running the programs. It's operating at full, at its maximum speed. You cannot start programs using the teach pendant when you're in auto mode. So you have to use that cycle power, that green button to start the robot when you're going into auto mode. All right, so let's talk briefly about powering up the robot. So how do we turn the robot on? Well, actually there's four methods that we can, that we can supply power to the robot. There's four methods that we can power the robot, okay? Uh, there's cold start, controlled start, hot start, and init start, or initialize start, okay? Each one of these has different parameters and different functions. So it's worthwhile to know wh what each one of those can do and cannot do when we want to power up a robot. Cold start is the most common method of powering the robot. That's the one that we use 99% of the time with the robot in our class. And basically with the cold start, what you're going to do is you're going to just flip the, uh, the, the power switch on the front of the control panel from off to on. That's it, okay? 
Um, when you're going to turn the robot off, you're going to do the opposite. You're going to turn the, uh, the uh, power dial from on to off. All right. So it's very simple. Um, in a cold start, it's going to initialize any changes to the system variable. So if we change a system variable, we will have to turn the robot off and then back on again. Okay, kind of like what you do with a computer or with a phone. Sometimes you, when you download a new app, you have to turn the phone off and then turn it back on again to have it reinitialized. That's kind of what we have to do sometimes when we set up different variables with the robot and we want to, um, and we want to have the robot start using those variables. So we have to turn the robot off and then back on again. Um, it also initialized changes to the input and output setup, the IO setup. And it displays utility hint screens uh, and displays the top menu on newer software. That, that's the one that we're using. There is also a controlled start. This is not commonly used. And it's used for specific functions outside of normal operations, such as loading a file backup or performing a file restore. So uh, we would use controlled start when we wanted to uh, copy a file. All right. It initializes changes to system variables like the cold start does. It initializes changes to the I.O. setup like the cold start does. Uh, but we're not turning the robot all the way off and on. It's activated during power up by holding the previous and next keys on the teach pendant together. All right. So in order to um, to cycle the controller power from the teach pendant, we're going to go to the function. We're going to select zero or next. We're going to go to cycle power, which is number eight right there. We're going to press enter or press eight. Eight corresponds to that on the keypad. We can press eight or we can just hit enter and then select yes when it asks us, do we want to cycle the power? So turning on the robot, the first thing that we have to know is we have to check that all personnel and unnecessary equipment are out of the work cell. Okay. Turning on the robot, sometimes the robot can, uh, make erratic movements. Um, if there's programs that are still being run or still loaded in the robot memory, um, then the robot could make a jump or a movement very suddenly at full speed. And so we always, before we turn the robot on, we always want to make sure that everybody and everything is out of the area, out of the work cell. We want to visually inspect the robot, the controller, the work cell, and the surrounding area. Make sure all the safeguards are in place and the work envelope is clear of personnel. Then we want to turn the power disconnect circuit breaker switch on the operator panel to on. Okay. Um, obviously, if you find any problems in step one, when you visually inspect the robot, then you do not want to assert the power on. Now, there is one condition in our class, and that is we always, uh, students are not allowed to turn the robot on. Instructors have to turn the robot on. So that's um, a, a thing that we, uh, a, a condition that we have in class just for safety purposes. All right, and so that brings us to the conclusion of chapter four, Robot Systems. Uh, please read further in your chapter in the textbook for more information and additional details. Thank you.